I feel uh, very privileged to be here. Jason's <clears throat> had me on ancient paths before, which I, I was felt very privileged to be asked, and uh, and don't know how he picked me to be part of this. It's been 20 years since I did anything like this, um, and I realized in preparing that it was a good thing to come back and uh, to see that. Um, discussions about this particular subject have, have evolved, have changed, uh, and I, I think they've become a little more cordial in most venues, and I'm, I'm glad for that. And I'm wondering why any of you are here on a Friday night. Um, your social calendars are obviously slim, um, and you're not at, at least seeing Jane Goodall down at the uh, Marriott, maybe because this is free, I don't know, but get started. Uh, I, I wanted to start with a little biographical information. I was, I was not raised in a church-going home. Uh, my first real encounter with Jesus was a fourth grade vacation uh, Bible school experience in a Missouri Synod Lutheran church um, among wonderful, warm people. Um, and my memory of that goes specifically to uh, uh, a kind of brown and white film uh, done on a very low budget of uh, the life of Jesus. And I remember being taken aback. Uh, again, I'm only fourth grade, but you know, your brain starts producing meaningful brain cells about them. Uh, and I was uh, impressed in a way that uh, goes beyond impression uh, by the story of the woman taken in adultery. Uh, of course, in fourth grade, I didn't know what adultery was. I just knew it was bad, whatever it was. Uh, and I remember uh, this Jesus, who I'd seen in a prayer film uh, one or two mornings before, uh, say, let him who is without sin cast the first stone. And I, I was uh, deeply impressed with that. Uh, and. Uh, it's amazing to think that going back all these years to that, that you know, there are movies I saw in fourth grade I'd never see again, and uh, books I read when I was very small I don't look at anymore, but that comment and that person has engaged me uh, until this day in a way that has been uh, more than profound. I began going to Sunday school after that at that church. Uh, I remember uh, taking home a hardback lesson book. They gave us those in those days. And uh, on the first page, it talked about how we are to fear and love God. And my mother had a fit about that part about fearing God. Uh, and so my, my days were numbered with the Lutherans just simply because of that. But I was saved, technically, uh, at a Baptist camp meeting when I was 13 years old. Uh, and I think my, my thirst for things of God, which had been wedded in fourth grade, had, had not abated one bit. Uh, I was the first person to come forward uh, responding to an altar call at that time. Uh, and uh, the first thing I was given before I even got home was a book about Bible problems. Uh, that came into my hands even before the first Bible I owned. Uh, but this was something they gave out at the camp. And I remember uh, very well um, them saying, now, now you're going to read in Genesis about people like Methuselah and Noah and other, other people who lived uh, hundreds of years. Uh, and, and not to be uh, put off by that, uh, they said, because uh, those people were just a, a few generations removed from uh, Adam and Eve, and God made a better product starting out. Um, since then, the breed had deteriorated. And I remember thinking, maybe, or maybe these people are trying a little too hard. Uh, but that had an effect on me at the time. The book taught me that the world was around 6,000 years old, and that dinosaurs never existed, but that God did indeed put dinosaur bones in the earth that were dug up by archaeologists, and they were there to test our faith. Uh, though my conversion uh, was deep and sincere and obviously lasting, uh, those, those things in that book made me 
somewhat uneasy about church and about what people who uh, were experts in uh, things of God uh, may or may not know. Um, I sensed in the men at the church that I was going to, uh, a very small uh, Baptist sect, uh, a defensiveness about their, their faith and a kind of humorlessness. And I, I saw the same people Sunday after Sunday go forward uh, in answer to the altar call uh, and wondered why that could possibly be if you were saved. Uh, years later, um, I ran into the bumper sticker motto that many of you have probably seen or heard uttered before. God said it, I believe it, that settles it. And it could have after those words, the words, now don't make me think about it anymore. Um, I found, this is my way of saying that I found my way to a Presbyterian church a couple of months uh, into my new faith as a teenager. Uh, and that church did not ask me to check my brain at the door uh, or tell me that any rumi rumor, rum ruminations I had about my faith were necessarily of the devil. But I still have an affection for my Baptist beginnings uh, and a gratefulness too. I sometimes listen to uh, family radio uh, out of Oakland, California, and they still play reruns of Harold Camping, uh, who started that whole thing, uh, and his question and answers about the Bible. Remember Harold, the late, late Harold, he died this last year, I think it was. Uh, he was the one who said that the world was going to end on May 21st, 2011. Uh, not so long ago, I heard someone call in Again, this is a rerun, uh, with an honest question about Judas, the one who betrayed Jesus. Matthew's Gospel says that after Jesus' crucifixion, Jesus, Judas threw down his 30 pieces of silver uh, before the elders in the temple, and then went out and hanged himself. And then uh, Acts says he, he bought a field with his 30 silver coins, and then fell, fell down one day on it, and his insides burst open, and he died. And the person who called was asking about that, saying, there seems to be a discrepancy here. And I remember Harold Camp Camping saying, no, 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 dis no discrepancy at all. He said, uh, Judas went out and hanged himself, and obviously the rope broke, and he fell, and, and that probably killed him. Uh, and I thought, oh my gosh, the mental gymnastics people go through to maintain a particular, rather narrow view of the Bible uh, that makes, I think, their own Christianity often kind of brittle, uh, rigid, uh, full of fear, obviously, uh, of, of a kind of faith that is, is a little bit too light of the break, to my mind. Well, this discussion... Uh, about whether or not homosexuality and Christianity are consistent and compatible um, has a lot to do, not everything, but a lot to do with how we read the Bible, as I'm sure you know. Uh, one of my Presbyterian pastors growing up was a man named Earl Palmer, a uh, pretty well-known uh, preacher out of First Presbyterian Church, Berkeley, California, a very solidly evangelical church uh, uh, and he was, he was so noted, uh, I mean, people came by the thousands to hear him preach. Now, Earl taught us quite a lot of things uh, when, I was, when I was young, and I remember two things that I want to share here because they, mean, they meant so much to me growing up and continue to mean a lot to me. The first thing is that he said, be careful of anyone who holds up the word of God, the Bible, and says, the Bible says... Because the Bible says a lot of things, and speaks with a lot of voices, and sometimes Christians will use it as a weapon against other people, including other Christians. Uh, when I was young, the hot issue uh, among conservative Christians was whether women could serve in the church. It was kind of the, I mean, there were debates about it just like there are debates about this issue. Uh, and teaching us about what the Bible said about women and their role in the church, uh, Reverend Palmer said, be careful 
of any person or any group in the church that takes that verse about women being silent in the church and, and who will choose to use it as a weapon to silence half the members of the Christian religion. Well, both those statements, uh, as I said, uh, were seminal for me. The Bible has been put to unworthy use as a weapon which I don't think Jesus would ever do for at least a thousand years. The Bible was quoted in 1215 in order to defend the divine right of kings and to oppose the Magna Carta, which guaranteed rights for all men, not women, but at least for men. The story of the Tower of Babel from Genesis was quoted in the 17th century as a weapon against Galileo to prove that the earth was the center of a three-tiered universe. How? Well, in the story of the Tower of Babel, God is worried that these people are going to build a tower up to heaven, remember? Now, today, none of us shares Galileo, excuse me, Genesis' view of, of a flat earth anymore. Uh, we've all seen pictures of the earth from the moon, it's round, not flat, uh, and up, whether it's to heaven or anything else, is very much a relative term. But the Catholic Church has choose to use that story, our Bible, as a weapon to defeat a scientist named Galileo. For more than 200 years, most Americans, including Christian Americans, shared several assumptions regarding slavery and segregation in this country. Most people believed that the Bible recorded God's judgment on the sin of people of African descent through what Genesis called the mark of Cain or the sin of Ham in the story of Noah. Both were quoted over and over again. People of African descent were considered inferior morally. They were considered willfully sinful and usually sexually promiscuous and deserving of punishment for their own actions. You will only have to watch the movie 20, 12 Years a Slave or, or read Solomon Northup's memoir uh, if you doubt me on this. We abhor such views now, but back then these views were considered common sense by white people. Way back in the 4th century, St. Augustine of Hippo had written in his book, The City of God, that slavery was justified because of the sin of the people enslaved. And he took a biblical view to back that up. Again, the Bible being used as a weapon against people who are on the march. After slavery, those same passages were used as a weapon to justify segregation and apartheid. Similarly, the Bible has been used, particularly in the story of Adam and Eve, to say that women are inferior to men morally. In the third century, the theologian Tertullian spoke of women as the devil's gateway. Now that's hard to stomach for most. But look, the Tenth Commandment says that you are not to covet your neighbor's wife or his ox or his donkey. Women were seen as the property of the men they married for thousands of years. Women were given by their fathers to men for a bright price. I happen to think that's rather abominable, and thank heaven we have had increasing, increasing consciousness about such things. Well, the Bible doesn't speak with one voice concerning women, but the evidence of the Gospels teaches us that Jesus had an attitude about women that was totally out of context for its time. From everything we can see and surmise, from the Gospels, it's clear that Jesus accepted women and children as full human beings. No one else in his time thought that. 
Scholars tell us that there was no way that Jesus could have traveled about the hill country of Galilee, going safely from town to town, unless he went with a company of women and children. Had he merely traveled with a dozen men, they would have been identified as bandits and beaten up when entering a town outside of their home base of Capernaum. His words about children are, again, totally out of context for the first century. Over and over, he speaks in favor of special treatment for children. He greeted them, he blessed them, he healed them, he raised at least one Jairus' daughter from the dead. And all this love heaped on them in an age when many parents didn't even choose to name their children until they were five years old, acknowledging that they were likely to die before reaching that age. As I've said, individual verses have been used as weapons to hammer down people of color and women and, yes, people of differing sexual orientation for a good long time. But if you stand back and look at the forest instead of just the trees, look at the scriptures in the context of the times they were written, and they were written over a period of a thousand years and more, I think you just might pick up the trajectory of love that God, through the Holy Spirit, is in trying to open our hearts to. Hebrews 4 says, The Word of God is a living and active, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing until it divides soul from spirit, joint from marrow. It is able to judge the thoughts and intentions of the heart. You know, from the very beginning, the church has borne witness to how the scriptures judging the thoughts and intentions of those many hearts have time and again overturned established assumptions and brought light out of darkness. We have a record in the book of Acts of how the Holy Spirit kindled a fire in the hearts of Jesus' followers about the despised and unclean Gentiles. Condemned totally by biblical law, Gentile outsiders were considered so unclean that Jesus' followers wouldn't even sit down and eat with them. But God's word and spirit helped the church see those despised outsiders as beloved children of God. The result was a whole new reading of Scripture. Let me say that again. A whole new reading of Scripture. And the inclusion of a formerly reviled and ostracized people into the fellowship of Christ's body, the church. The Holy Spirit is alive. And the Word of God is powerful. In the late Middle Ages, Word came to life in the heart of a troubled monk named Martin Luther. The result was a new reading of Scripture. And the results and the release of millions of anguished Christians from a thousand-year captivity to guilt and fear and superstition and condemnation into the clear light of God's grace and mercy through Christ. The Word of God, when used by the Holy Spirit, is powerful. Uh, I'll pick up my uh, comments in a little bit. We've done the 20, right? And one, okay. Oh, we have one more minute? Okay, thank you. I, I, didn't, I thought maybe I was done. Um, at the height of the Reformation, uh, a friend of Martin Luther's found him sitting idly one day over a drink. And Luther, uh, Luther, Dr. Luther said to friend, look at everything that's happening. Look at the crisis that, that's upon us. Don't you think you should be in Bavaria preaching at this hour? And Luther sat back in his chair, looked at the monk, and said, here as I drink my little glass of Wittenberg beer, the gospel runs its course. Now, some people see the ordination of gay and lesbian Christians to ministry in mainline churches like my own as a sign that God has forsaken the world. Others of us see it as we saw the ordination of women and the civil rights movement as a sign that the Spirit of God is actually very much alive today and continuing to make change and open eyes. We believe that Christ is risen and loose in the world, that the gospel is still running its course. And noted scholars like Jack Rogers and my own denomination, and the Baptist pastor and distinguished professor of Christian ethics, David Gushy, 
have both had Damascus Road conversions on the subject that we are debating tonight. They have gone from being among the most effective voices against 